Thank you very much. I thought I would sort of skirt around the edges of the topic first, since I didn't know Ein as well as Barbara does. Uh, and then she will occupy the center of the, of the subject uh, after me. I came to know Ayn Rand in the early 1960s when she uh, gave a lecture, Faith and Force, uh, at Brooklyn College where I was teaching. And uh, after that, I invited her to lunch and she said, okay, I've got one hour. Uh, that was at noon and we were still sitting there discussing philosophical subjects at six o'clock. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that that was the beginning of uh, a comparatively long uh, relation. Uh, I knew her for regular and saw her regularly for th about three years before coming to California in the later 60s. Uh, she uh, went to an NBI lecture and then I <coughs> was invited to her apartment. I came with a cop very much marked copy of Atlas Shrugged and she said, I'll trade you. So she gave me an autographed copy of hers. I said, well, these comments in the margin are really, uh, they're just my own reactions. They, they're not necessarily the most important things. She said, that's all right. That's why I want them. I want to see what your spontaneous reactions are. And she said, at first, if we want to discuss Atlas Shrugged, we'll discuss the aesthetic aspects. I want to know what you think of it as a work of art. Well, that helped to get our friendship off on a very pleasant footing because, of course, I had nothing but admiration for Atlas Shrugged. So I discussed with her the structure of it and the intricate way it was put together. Uh, even at her request, I, she wanted to hear favorite passages, what passages I liked the best. And so uh, I seized upon several of them, first of all, uh, the one of the opening of the railroad in Colorado, and that turned out was one of her favorite passages. I said, "Well, but you know all this. I mean, you know, I, you know, you know I, just, I, I want to hear it from you. What you, th what, what you think of these various points?" And so, for uh, several evenings, uh, we usually met every two weeks. So for several evenings, we discussed various aspects of it. She said, "Well, we'll leave the philosophy alone for the moment." Uh, I just want your aesthetic reactions. Well, from that we went to, to other things. <clears throat> uh, we discussed various works of literature. Uh, I, I had memorized considerable parts of Shakespeare, and I would quote some of those to her. She wasn't too impressed by Shakespeare, uh, and I never did get an agreement with her on that. Uh, too much of a tragic sense of life, and so on. But uh, there were other things on which our reactions co corresponded uh, precisely. Uh, she indicated, uh, uh, she, she showed me a, a few things that she enjoyed uh, in literature, uh, and sort of to my surprise, uh, she turned to some poems by Swinburne. She said, no, this is not philosophy. I don't necessarily agree with his views, but just as as pure poetry, uh, this is near perfection. And I agreed, but I also thought that Shakespeare's sonnets probably merited that, uh, that, that, that same praise. Anyway, we went through that a number of times, uh, and we got onto music. It was about at that time that she was starting to uh, have a weekly broadcast on the Columbia University radio station. I think it lasted for about a year, and uh, we wanted some opening music. So I brought along a whole bunch of, of, of records. I thought good introductory music. Uh, so I had some of Handel, uh, <coughs> Handel overtures, uh, uh, bits of Bach, uh, Purcell's trumpet voluntary, things that I thought would just be ideal to introduce a program. She didn't want any of those. Um, what she wanted, is she said, all these, this is 17th and 18th century, that's a static universe. 
I said, well, if, if you want a dynamic universe, how about Beethoven? How about Wagner? Well, she didn't want those either. We ended up with what was her favorite, Rachmaninoff. Her two favorite composers were Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky. I didn't consider it accidental that they were both Russian. Uh, she thought that all uh, aesthetic judgments <clears throat> were objective. She said, I can't prove it in the case of music. She said, I don't know what to say about those. But she said, they, all these are objective qualities that I discern. And then uh, I, I said, look, I, mean, I think that a lot of the terms that we use to praise or dispraise works of art, terms like beautiful, uh, uh, terms like appealing, uh, terms like expressive, they have more to do with our reactions to the work than they do with the nature of the work itself. I said, now granted, many of them may be a mix, but I said, we have to disentangle these because we want to keep apart the terms that, that describe something and terms that describe the qualities of something and those that describe our reactions to it. And, uh, but all right, there, there was some degree of disagreement there. It's very difficult to encapsulate in just a few minutes what, was actually, what took place over a long time and then was forgotten again and then resumed at a later time. We did a great deal of this. Uh, but this, it is through this uh, through aesthetic concepts that I got an idea of what objectivism means. See, all aesthetic qualities are objective. They're out there. They're really in the object, you see. And I expressed some doubts about that. Not that I was a subjectivist. I wasn't. But <clears throat> I said that um, many qualities, many so-called qualities, uh, uh, in, including the sec secondary qualities, as they're called, like color, shape, smell of objects, I, th those also uh, may be relative to the uh, state of the observer and dependent on the observer's organism and so on. You see, that's all that I, that w I, tried, <clears throat> I always try to think of exceptions to whatever, whatever general principle is enunciated. That sometimes irritated her, but sometimes she, she enjoyed it as well. And so we had spent some time on secondary qualities and then the so-called tertiary qualities like beauty and goodness and so on. But in general, her position is these, they're all really out there. Could we but, could we but know it? It's, the difficulty is in our appreciation. And I didn't necessarily agree with that, but uh, we would go from one subject to another in a uh, in friendly way. She I think her ideal art was always heroic and like, like Atlas. Uh, and I think I was much more tolerant of a lot of things in art that she was sort of intolerant of. I liked Picasso, she didn't. Uh, uh, I liked James Joyce. She had no patience with James Joyce at all. Uh, and there were occasional arguments about this, friendly arguments. I would sometimes take her to concerts and ballet, modern dance. She didn't always like it, and, uh, but we had a great time there, and uh, there just isn't time to discuss everything that I could say uh, about those wonderful evenings that we spent uh, in restaurants, concert halls, and so on. Then we'd go to her place and talk until usually till four o'clock in the morning and very often we're still talking at eight in the morning and she'd make me breakfast and I'd go off to class. <laughs> and that happened many times over a period of several years. It's difficult to give a brief impression of these. Uh, I think I was somewhat more pessimistic in my view of the universe than she was. 
I've mentioned once, for instance, the status of animals. I said, which animal would want to come into this world knowing that they'd only be prey for other animals, none of them living to old age, all of them, say, dying from hunger, disease, and so on and so on. She didn't exactly deny that, but she thought I was emphasizing the wrong thing. Uh, and uh, in fact, although I was pessimistic about that, I told her, look, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to take a realistic view of things. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not personally depressed. I feel life is wonderful, but I'm just trying to see the universe as it is. And uh, curiously, when I expressed some reservations about the profession I was in, of teaching, uh, and uh, that I would have a class and I'd try to clarify their concepts, and I'd work hard tr uh, on the students and then the, year, the term or the year would be over and just as they were starting to get somewhere then you'd have a whole bunch of uh, new ones the next, the next term and then the, full of the same mistakes as the previous ones and uh, then it would all start over again and I said, this is becoming monotonously rep repetitive. She said, no. She said, you are in the most influential profession in the world. You may not know it, but you are. It's ideas. It's ideas, not physical things, that mold the world. And she said, the, uh, it's, it, it's when bad ideas replace good ones, that's when we have the kind of world that we have now. I never forgot that. It sort of gave me renewed inspiration to go ahead with my profession. And I never, since then, reached the, the doldrums in my feeling about the profession that I did at the time, that I had, was in at the time that I met her. Well, all right. she had, we disagreed a lot about contemporary philosophy. She hadn't read a lot in contemporary philosophy, especially Anglo-American. And it was difficult to convey a brief impression of that because so much of this involves multiple meanings of words and, and things that she didn't really have much patience with. And I thought that this was the important and essential avenue for getting to that. She thought, apparently, that most modern philosophers, by modern, she meant 20th century, that most modern philosophers were skeptics about the existence of a physical world. And I said, well, they take the physical world to be a hypothesis which is highly confirmed, if not totally validated. I said, but uh, none of them deny it. Well, she thought that it would be unusual to find a, f a philosopher who, who took the existence of the physical world as axiomatic and did not require any argumentation. And I showed her uh, a long article of one of my favorite contemporary philosophers, Norman Malcolm of Cornell. I still remember the article, and I, I, tra I typed up the argument of the article for her called Knowledge and Verification. And the, con the conclusion was that knowledge of certain things about the physical world around us is not just probable, but, act but, but certain. And, and she said, let's get him over here and talk with him, because he, this would be the exception in contemporary philosophy. I said, no, that, that's not the exception. The, the modern philosophers are, are not what you apparently think they are. They may, they may put on a skeptical guise, and they may say a lot of things that are skeptical, uh, skeptical about perception, skeptical about science, skeptical about religion. You can be skeptical about all sorts of things. But uh, 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 she was always suspicious of that, thought that I was presenting contemporary philosophy in all too rosy hue in order to promote it to her. And, uh, and to the end, she had, she had very little patience with it. I might have come through to her on a few things, but our backgrounds were too were dissimilar. I didn't really fully understand what hers was until I read Chris Yabara's book uh, on Ayn Rand, which came out last year about her education in Petersburg and so on. That's a long, long story, which I can't go into here. But uh, uh, we, had, we had lots of friendly disagreements. Some of them not so friendly. I always tried to be easygoing, friendly, but I, I could see the signs of impatience and sometimes anger rising. Uh, there, was, there was always a reason for the, uh, for the anger. Uh, she was, for instance, I remember that one night I quoted her quite casually, Anatole France's statement, uh, the rich have the same right as the poor to sleep under bridges. 
and that really set her off. But just she was apoplectic with anger, and I, I, I didn't understand that at the time. I subsequently saw, you know, she saw so much in that, but to refute it, to talk about property rights and how if there were sufficient attention to property rights, the things that were described in this about the poor sleeping under bridges would not occur. I mean, that was a long, long story, and I wasn't yet all that into free enterprise economics and so on, but we went into that all, uh, 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 quite a bit later. Uh, when she had these bouts of anger, I, always, I could always detect that there was something very profound behind it, and I didn't always realize what that was. Uh, so I tried to keep an even keel and just tried to learn from her, and I did learn a great deal from her, even as I tried to teach her some things about contemporary philosophy that, that, that she really didn't know, or some things where I thought it was misrepresented to her, and I tried to give it a fair appraisal. Uh, there are lots of, and I don't have time to go into those, I'll go into one or two very briefly. Uh, We discussed, for example, causality. And I casually threw out the suggestion to her uh, uh, once upon a time. If A occurs, and then B occurs, and then that happens again, A, B, A, B, A, B, then we have some title to say that A caused B. And she immediately recognized this as Hume's constant conjunction theory of causality. And uh, she didn't like that at all. Of course, I was about to augment this theory. I wasn't satisfied with Hume just that, as it was stated, but I said, uh, you know, look, uh, uh, if, if you're in a theater and you're hearing the clattering of horses' hooves on the film and just at that moment an earthquake shakes the theater, you get the impression that the earthquake is what caused the clattering of horses' hooves. I said, but and if, if it turned out at every time you saw that film there was an earthquake in the theater, then you would suspect that there was some causal relation between the two. That, that was an example of what was ordinarily called the regularity view of causation. But I said, of course, be careful. Uh, a person can say, uh, I get up an hour before sunrise every morning and bow to the east, and lo and behold, every morning the sun rises. But lest I think that my, my action caused the sun to rise, so one morning I won't get up, and then I'll see what happens. And then you'll know what does and does not help cause the sunrise. So I went into this in quite a, a good deal of detail. And she said, yes, but that's not enough. In causation, the cause acts upon the effect. And I said, oh, OK, OK. But now let's see what this phrase, act on, means. Uh, what about situations like, uh, uh, I said, traditional situation, the, this the domino is near that domino, and the first hits the second, the second hits the third, and so on, until the tenth one comes down. This is causation by contact. This is the most familiar one, the familiar to us in everyday life. That, the one acts upon the other, in a clear sense. Now, what about uh, this situation? The sun is over here, another star is many light years away, but there is a considerable gravitational attraction from the one to the other. What acts on what? Well, the sun acts on the other star. Yes, but there's, it certainly is not in the traditional way, because there's nothing between them. Uh, I said, well, in the 19th century ether hypothesis, there is something permeating all space that is between them. Uh, but I said, that theory went out at the end of the 19th century, and uh, it has never been revived. But I said, would you say that that is, would you say nevertheless that that's acting on? Huh? It seems to say, yes, that was acting on, even though it action at a distance. Yeah, yeah, that, that seems to be okay so far. Then we got into discussion of ESP. I didn't know that that was such an explosive issue with her. I was just wandered into it, you know, un, un, unknowing. And uh, I was presenting some data that I had read about the so-called Shackleton experiment in Great Britain about, uh, uh, a person in one room uh, guessing what, 
cards were being pulled simultaneously when a bell rang in another room, soundproof, three, do th th three rooms away, and so on. Uh, a bunch of scientists there to make sure there was no, no uh, dirty work going on, and no cheating of any kind. And uh, here's one person who almost always gets it right. I mean, here's, this, here's uh, cards, uh, a bunch of cards, spades, clubs, and so on. And suppose that when clubs is, is being drawn over here, the guy over three rooms away always guesses correctly what it is. I said, no, that's, uh, if you define ESP as one mind having access to another mind without the intermediary of the sense organs in, in between, this seems to be a pretty good case of ESP. And uh, uh, no, no. She thought it was shameful that I even read that stuff. Uh, that's not the way nature works. You're misconceiving the nature of the world. I, I said, well, you, but you can't just say a priori what nature is like. You can't just figure it out as you do in mathematics. Sometimes you have to look and see. And if the evidence favors ESP, and I, did, I don't care whether it does or not, but if it does, well, then we have to accept it, even though we can't explain it. This seemed to me just eminently commonsensical. She never got over that. She thought this was not the way nature works, and I should have known better to begin with, and, uh, and any attempt to show that ESP might actually exist is fraudulent. I mean, I should be onto the fraud before I even started with the business. Uh, I said, well, you know, I can't really know these things a priori. Some things we have to look and observe. And, and, and see. And uh, that, that was a regular, things like this became a regular bill of fare uh, between us. Uh, when <clears throat> we talked about the causal principle that everything that happens has some cause or other, and I, I she thought that it was true. Yeah, and in general, I did too. But I said, what is the status of this, of this statement? Is it a statement at all? Since, I said, it's epistemologically very suspect, don't you think, Ein? Because every time we find a cause for something, we say, yeah, the causal principle's been further confirmed. But when we don't find it, we, said, we don't say it was disconfirmed, we say, we haven't found it yet. And when I see those one-sided businesses, I, I get suspicious. So that is what led some people to say the causal principle is not a statement about the world at all. It is a kind of rule of the game, uh, the rule of the scientific game. Uh, we, we adopt it as a rule. Uh, it helps us to find more causes that encourages us and so on, has certain pragmatic effects. But maybe it's neither true nor false. Uh, well, and, and I mentioned a lot of things that look as if they're statements, factual reports about the universe, and maybe, I said, maybe, just maybe, they're not reports of the universe, the, uh, what the universe gives us, it's what we import and bring to the universe. Uh, and we see it through some of our own expectations and desires. Uh, well, that smacked a little bit of Kant, although I didn't put it in those terms. Uh, and uh, again, that, that, was, that was totally rejected. There were a whole bunch of issues like that. I mean, we discussed definitions. We discussed uh, uh, a great many, uh, just hosts of philosophical issues, and just some scientific ones, too. In general, she didn't have a lot of sympathies with certain developments in contemporary science. She totally rejected, say, the Heisenberg principle of indeterminacy and so on. And uh, uh, again, Einstein's statement, God did not play dice with the universe. But uh, when I suggested, well, you know, maybe the indeterminacy is right out there in nature. It's not just that there is a definite situation and we don't know what it is, but it's that it, the indeterminacy is really out there. And she was sort of ashamed of me that I should think such a thing. I, the, the, my head wasn't really on quite straight that I, <coughs> that I would say things like that. Uh, and so it continued. 
I'm only giving a very, very brief impression, and I'm almost uh, through. There were, uh, we discussed theory of definition many, many times. I don't have a chance to, uh, to do all that right now. Anybody that wants to ask about it will, will, will I'll, I'll, I'll amplify on just about anything that you, that you care to discuss. But uh, I just wanted to give a brief hint of the sort of thing that we, that we sometimes uh, uh, talked about. Uh, she was, sometimes she'd get very angry that, that something that she thought I was confused about uh, or something that I had said. And then she'd go into the kitchen and prepare tea and I'd hear the clattering of cups and she came back and she'd come back and say, this was a philosophical anger. It's not a personal anger. It's not directed against you. And so sometimes when I said something that she very much approved of or liked, she'd say, I love you in the true philosophical sense of that term. Oh, I didn't know exactly what that was, but I, I, I wasn't going to ask any. And so I'd say, well, that, that's true of me in spades. I, uh, uh, and <clears throat> well, 30 years have elapsed. And I still miss her tremendously. I think of her on all kinds of occasions. Barbara and I were discussing this the other day. She was saying that when the Berlin Wall came down, she was thinking of Ein and I was too. Uh, and the same now today that her books are available in Russian in her own native, native Leningrad. It's unfair that she didn't live to see that. That, that would have been tremendous. Uh, when the Ayn Rand letters appeared. Uh, it was an experience of vividly re-experiencing things of many years ago that I thought had faded from memory somewhat, and they hadn't. When I wrote my book on ethics a year and a half or so ago, and I was writing at it, it's the book I have before me here, Human Conduct, just came out earlier in 1996. I thought of her a great deal. It wasn't primarily about her. She does figure prominently in it. Uh, and I discuss her a bit. And I, especially issues like the refutation of socialism. I thought she would like that. She would appreciate it. On the other hand, I could also hear her saying, uh, John, I told you so. This isn't right. You shouldn't say that. But I also might think, I'd say, Yes, you were right about that. You still have the 19th century mind that I like. Forget about, the, for, forget about the 20th century. Go back to the 19th century and you'll be okay. I, how, how many times she had said to me variations of things like that. Maybe she would even have said, maybe. I'm sorry I got angry with you about this because now I see where you are coming from. Anyway, it's many years ago, but it was a great experience, one that life would just not have been quite as wonderful if it hadn't happened. Okay, I guess I better stop there, but after Barbara's finished, any questions, we go ahead. And